I'm joined now by two guests. Congressmember Dennis Kucinich joins us from Cleveland, Ohio. He voted against both the Affordable Health Care for America Act and the STUPAC Amendment. We're also joined in Washington, D.C. by the founder of the popular blog, Fire Dog Lake, Jane Hampshire. And we welcome you both to Democracy Now! Before we go to the congressman, Jane Hampshire, just lay out exactly what this bill that passed by a squeaker, 220 to 215, uh, what exactly it mandates, if in fact it joins with the Senate and then it's reconciled? Well, we would get uh, a bill that has a public option that would cover uh, not a lot of people in it, uh, but it would get rid of people being excluded for pre existing conditions. Uh, it has a community rating and uh, it also has a provision that grants an endless monopoly on biologic drugs, uh, sort of the drugs of the future that mean that they will never come into generic form and uh, will cost in perpetuity, you know, 50 to 80 to $100,000 a year and only be able to be available to people who can afford them. Uh, it also has a provision barring any insurance a company or uh, a public option who offers insurance on the exchange from providing abortion services, which means that uh, you would have to go to a private insurance company that wasn't on the exchange in order to get a policy that covered it, effectively keeping uh, you know, poor people from being able to afford those policies. So it is a, a huge victory for Bart Stupak and the uh, anti-abortion Democrats. Mm -hmm. How many people now would be covered, uh, would get health care that don't normally have it? Uh, I believe that uh, it's going to cover approximately 95 percent of Americans, uh, but that is with a mandate, and that assumes that uh, people uh, uh, comply with uh, the terms and do purchase insurance. Uh, but there, the mechanism for uh, enforcement is, uh, is, is still uh, questionable as to whether that will, will work or not. And explain the politics of the House, how it, exactly it passed 220 to 215, who was for, who was against. Well, in the House, uh, you had Democrats in the Progressive Caucus who were trying to decide whether they should take a stand at the last minute after Bart Stupak and the pro-choice, uh, the pro-life Democrats decided to hold up the bill uh, unless they got their amendment through. They wound up being supported by 64 member, 64 Democrats uh, in order to pass it. And the Progressive Caucus decided that they were not going to take a stand at this point. Uh, at, the, at this morning, we have Diane DeGette saying that she has 40 votes uh, in Congress to be able to stop the bill from going through if it comes back through from conference and has the, uh, the anti-choice uh, stipulations in it. But she hasn't been joined by any of the pro-choice groups, uh, NARAL and Planned Parenthood, who sort of uh, laid around since Ju Ju July 1st, I believe, when Stupak first wrote his letter, and didn't do anything about this. So whether they'll actually have the political will to carry through on this or not is questionable. Mm. We're going to go now to Cleveland, uh, to the home district of Congressmember Dennis Kucinich. Um, Congressmember Kucinich, you voted no on the health care bill, one of the 215. Why? Because it's not the best we can do. It mandates people purchase private insurance. It is a $70 billion giveaway to private insurance companies and locks in this system that's the problem, not the solution. And so I made every effort right from the beginning, as you know, as a single-payer advocate, we couldn't really make this bill single-payer. That was taken off the table. But we did something else. We were able to get a bill in the committee passed that would protect the right of states to be able to have, uh, to pursue a, a not-for-profit health care plan at a state level uh, to shield it from legal attack. And that was taken out of the uh, legislation uh, after it had passed, it was taken out by the administration, uh, which has whittled down the public option to the point of, uh, of not having it truly compete with insurance companies. So what you have here is the people continuing to be at the mercy of the insurance companies, except in this case, the government's going to subsidize the policies. People are still going to have premiums, co-pays, and deductibles to deal with. And, you know, there's, there's really a, a great deal of question here as to what in the world we're doing in creating a health care system that's really based on the premises of private insurance. Do you think it's better than what we have now? 
No, actually it's not because it locks us into a for-profit system that the government subsidizes. It's not going to save money in the long run. It's not going to provide the kind of broad health care services the American people need. It's going to limit the choices that people have over a longer period of time. And people will have to buy private insurance. I mean, what's going on in this country? We're told that the only choice we have is to buy private insurance. And, and with the robust public option being gone, it makes sure that there's little competition with the insurance companies. This bill doesn't uh, effectively moderate what they can charge for premiums or co-pays or deductibles. It just says people have to have insurance. Well, insurance doesn't necessarily equate to care, and, uh, and, and care comes at a cost. How do you compare the public option in the House bill with the Senate bill? Well, that remains to be seen. I mean, Senator Baucus has had a couple different iterations. His first bill didn't have a public option at all. Uh, keep something in mind. When Mr. Hacker first came out with his proposal for a public option, it was going to cover 129 million Americans. That really would compete in, a, in, an, ex, uh, in an exchange with private insurance. But that's been whittled down to, depending on who you talk to, covering 6 to 11 million people. So only a fraction of Americans uh, will have a access to the public option, which means that uh, there's not effective competition with the insurance companies to drive down rates. And the Senate, we'll see what happens in the Senate. Uh, but, but as far as the House bill that I was confronted with, Amy, I, I just felt that, uh, uh, that an increased privatization of the health care system, requiring the purchase of private insurance, the government subsidizing it, it ends up being a redistribution of the wealth of this nation upwards, which lately seems to be the sole purpose of the government. I want to turn to a clip about what we could expect from the Senate. A Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina declared on CBS's Face the Nation that the bill would be, quote, dead on arrival in the Senate. The House bill is dead on arrival in the Senate. Just look at how it passed. It passed 220 to 215. <clears throat> it passed by two votes. You had 40 Demo 39 Democrats vote against the bill. They come from red states moderate Democrats from swing, uh, swing districts, uh, they bailed out on this bill. It was a bill we're written by liberals for liberals, and people like Joe Lieberman are not going to get anywhere near the House bill. It cuts Medicare by $500 billion. It's over a trillion dollars in new spending. It does have the public option. So the House bill is a non-starter in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Congress Member Kucinich, your response. Well, you know, making this about liberal and conservative is a phony argument to begin with. I mean, when I heard the Republicans attacking this bill in the House as a government-run uh, uh, health care system, I said, I wish, I, I wish that it would have been a, a not-for-profit, single-payer, universal system. Nothing like that. The fact that there's a shrinking public option is not uh, a credit to, to, to the bill. And the administration obviously was terrified that anything could be identified as being uh, adverse to the insurance companies, which is why they took privatization, uh, they took um, single-payer off the table immediately, they knocked down the robust public option, and, it, and, and after a amendment that would have protected the, uh, the right of states to pursue a single-payer system was passed by the Education and Labor Committee, uh, the administration weighed in heavily and influenced the leaders of Congress to take it out of the bill. I mean, American people are being locked into a for-profit uh, insurance uh, uh, structure. And we have to ask ourselves, why is this the best that we can do? Why should we settle for this without fighting back? Why shouldn't we insist that a robust public option is the only way to make sure that the American people really have a fighting chance with the insurance companies? As it is now, the government's going to be subsidizing the insurance companies. And we're, we're being told all the time, Amy, that our options uh, keep getting limited. We're told last year the only way people could get unemployment benefits is if Congress votes for war. The only way we can pass a hate crime is if Congress votes for war. Uh, the only way we can get housing is to give Wall Street a bailout, and that didn't put people back in, most people back in their homes who lost them. Uh, you know, we're going to get jobs by giving Wall Street a bailout. That didn't work. Businesses are going to be helped by giving Wall Street a bailout. That didn't work. Our whole economy is being organized in a way that takes the wealth of the nation and sends it right to the top. And, and this health care bill is no different. And we've got to fight back, and that's why I could not vote for this. If we were able to get a single payer to protect the right of states at a, uh, to have a single payer plan, maybe the bill would have been worth voting for. But that was taken out. So what are we left with? private-for-profit health insurance with the government subsidizing it.